Good morning and happy Sabbath. It's a blessing to be here this morning and to see each and every one of your smiling faces. I see mostly smiles. <laughs> if I wasn't up front, I'd be in the back as well, and I will not ask you to move up to the front. I feel just fine with everyone exactly where you are. It's a blessing to be here. I just always feel a little bit uncomfortable when people call me Elder Pinnock. I just, I just call me Pastor Will. I know I'm at the conference office. I've been there for a year, but we're just pastors as well, leading where God has called us to lead. Amen. And so today, I'm grateful to be able to come in. Pastor Tara had asked if I could share on goodness if I could. And today's message is entitled, Goodness Full Stop. Goodness Full Stop. Would you just bow your heads with me one more time? Father, as we look at your word, as we have been meditating in this music, as we have thought of your goodness and your love, may you speak. In Jesus' name, amen. Goodness. What is goodness? Is it simply good acts? Is it simply an expression that people say when they're surprised or in dismay? Goodness. Oh my goodness. Goodness gracious. A term that came to bear in the 1700s to make sure that people didn't take God's name in vain. Langston Hughes wrote a poem about goodness. He says, I am so tired of waiting, aren't you, for the world to become good and beautiful and kind. Let us take a knife and cut the world in two and see what worms are eating at the rind. Paul, in the Book of Galatians speaks to the worms before he gets to the fruit. He talks about the actions that are happening in our world that are causing so many things that are happening that are painful, unjust, unfair, just plain wrong. As we look at the news around us, it's easy to see what is eating at the Rhine, the wars that are happening in Ukraine and in other places in our in our world, the various things that we see on the news that remind us that this world is still not good. Not the good that God has made it to be, but that the kingdom is continuing to work in our hearts to bear goodness. I want to recommend this book. It's called Good and Beautiful and Kind by Rich Villados. It just came out uh, in the past week or so, and I, I picked up a copy, and I'm about halfway through, and it is such a great book on how we as Christians have been called to bear witness to God's goodness in a broken world, and fragmented world. Goodness is more than just trying to be right. Doing the right thing, saying the right thing, showing up and doing an act of kindness. That's great. But this idea of goodness that Paul is getting at is talking about actually being morally good, of actually being righteous. And if you look at Galatians as a whole, his whole book is dealing with how we are righteous. Goodness is a declaration of God, that God speaks into our life, Paul talks about. Goodness is something that we accept from God by faith. Goodness is something that grows and bears fruit in our lives by the power of the Holy Spirit. Do you say amen to that? Amen. amen. But just like us, the Galatians, got hung up on goodness. It's so easy to find this temptation in our lives where we, we, it's easier to find the affirmation of others than the affirmation of God. We don't see God. God, 
we know that God's presence is here by faith, but we don't always feel God in our lives. We don't see him physically, and so it's so easy to replace God with others' opinions about ourselves, with our own opinion of ourself, and to measure our goodness by the affirmation of others. But Paul says in Galatians chapter 2, verses 21, I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. These Galatians, these, these, these uh, church members of the church in Galatia, he, he, he writes this letter because they are getting hung up on the issue of being circumcised. And so, and so they're thinking that if they can be circumcised, that they are righteous because these Jews that have come in and are telling them that if they can do this, that they will be viewed as more righteous in the sight of God. And Paul vehemently attacks this idea. He goes on in Galatians 3 and verse 3, are you so foolish after beginning by the means of the Spirit, are you now trying to finish by the means of the flesh. In Galatians 3, 5, and 6, reading from the message translation, a paraphrase, he says, answer this question. Does the God who lavishly provides you with his own presence, his Holy Spirit, working things in your lives you could never do for yourselves, does he do these things because of your serious moral striving or because you trust in him to do them in you? This question that he brings, are you trying to do it through your own power or are you trusting for God to be the one to do it through you? I know this has been a theme throughout this series that, we've been, that you all have been focusing on, that God is the power behind this and that we must allow God to bear the fruit in our life. Fruit is different from gifts. Gifts is something that we are given, but fruit is something that we bear, that comes out of an experience and journey that we have in life with God. The temptation is to, again, allow others to define our goodness, to allow ourselves to define our goodness, to be okay with who we are, or to strive for a perfection that seems to always be outside of our grasp. But I love this quote from Auntie Ellen, Steps to Christ, page 67, paragraph 3. She says, as with life, so it is with growth. The plants and flowers grow not by their own care or anxiety or effort, but by receiving that which God has furnished to minister to their life. It is only something that we can experience as we receive from God. And she says, just as the plants, so it is with our life. So it is with our life. Goodness is very easily seen as kind of a measuring stick or something that I'm trying to achieve or something that I do or a quality that people see me as. For the most part, if someone drives past me, and they cut me off, I'm not going to flip them off or do anything to, 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 to uh, continue the road rage. I'm a pretty good person, right? Um, you know, I, I, you know, when someone gets upset and angry at me, I try to keep my cool and calm and be a, 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 an example of what it means to be a Christian. I'm a pretty good person. When my little girl, uh, <clears throat> you know, doesn't want to go to bed at night, and she is just taking her sweet time to go to sleep, and we are exhausted from the day, and I patiently am waiting for her to go to sleep. I'm a pretty good person, right? But Paul is saying our goodness is not known by our good acts, even though that will be the fruit. Our goodness is on our proximity to Christ. Here's the thing. It's hard to get close to Christ if you don't feel worthy, if you don't feel safe, if you don't feel like you can trust God 
it makes it difficult. I love how this word in, in the Greek, a goodness, definitely speaks to a, 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 an excellent character, kindness, and goodness, but it also teases out this idea of generosity. In several lexicons, this word goodness is seen as generosity. Generosity as the overflow of what goodness is. And so instead of being so caught up on goodness and how I do and how I respond, what happens if I shift to thinking of this as more of a space of generosity? I want to give you an example. In the story that Jesus tells, a parable, he tells a parable of an unforgiving servant. This unforgiving servant in Matthew 18 has, is, 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 is being told to Peter, to Peter's question about how often should I forgive someone who has done me wrong. And the, the tradition was three, maybe four times max. If someone has repeated this three times, three strikes and you're out, right? Four times, you're very forgiving. You're very gracious. And then Jesus tells this story. And, and we think of the story about forgiveness, but this story is about God's goodness and generosity. Because the servant is being called in because he owes the king 10,000 talents or 10,000 bags of gold. It's an immense sum of money, so much money that scholars say it would have taken about at least 20 years for him to try to pay it off. He could not support his family. He would have had to have been a slave for at least 20 years. Who knows if he had that much time in his life. And so he has no ability to pay off this debt. On the other hand, he has someone that owes him about three months worth of wages, daily wages. And so we have an immense unpayable sum and we have something that can be quite more easily paid and quite more easily forgiven. This servant pleads with the king to please, please forgive my debt. There is no way I can pay this. There is no way I can make this right. It is impossible, he says. And the king forgives him of his debt. And what happens in the story next is the heart of it. Because if someone has been forgiven something that they could impossibly, unable to pay off, to come from that moment and experience that amount of grace and forgiveness and to enter into the retrieval of more money from someone that owes him much less shows that he did not truly think or consider what had happened. He hadn't really taken it in. Maybe he didn't really trust that the king was going to really forgive him, and he's trying to get some extra money that maybe he can give back to the king when the king changes his mind. Maybe he's thinking, ah, you know, I don't know. i got to save up for a rainy day. I don't know. But he doesn't trust the king. Because if he truly trusted the king and took this act of generosity into his heart, he would have had the same level of generosity for this other person that owed him a certain amount of money. I think something that will help us to really come into a relationship with God when we are not feeling worthy, when we know our life isn't perfect and it's not living up to everything that God has called us to do. When we know we're in the same mistake again and we're asking God forgiveness again and, and we're in this space and we're not sure how God 
is filling. Even though we know he is loving, even though we know he is forgiving, we've heard it every Sabbath, every day, and yet we don't feel it and we distrust God. We are living from a space of scarcity instead of a space of abundance. God is calling us to recognize that he has everything for us, and the question is, will we accept it? This quote from Henry Nouwen says, this is the mystery of the Christian life, to receive a new self, a new identity which depends not on what we achieve, but on what we are willing to receive. Are you and I willing to receive the abundance that God has? Are we still operating on a space of scarcity? This world is full of scarcity. We live in a dog-eat-dog world where everyone is trying to look out for their best interests. And to truly trust that God is looking out for our interests, uh, it's a struggle at times. Another thing that's a struggle at times is to truly, when we get to this space, open up our heart fully to God. We know how to pray. We know how to sing. We know how to worship. We know how to say the different Adventist things, happy Sabbath. We know how to eat our haystacks. We know all of these things, right? But do we know how to sit in the quiet and stillness with God and be vulnerable with who we really are and allow God to see our true self, even though we know God sees it? Or do we present the best version of ourselves, the photoshopped version of ourselves, the spiritual cosmetic surgeon version of ourselves? Do we show God who we really are? I remember first coming into the conference after being a senior pastor down in San Diego for just a few years. And before that, I was associate pastor down there as well. And, and I remember Elder John Ciccarelli reaching out and saying, Will, what do you think about coming to work in the ministerial department? Well, he didn't say that. He says, what do you think about working, you know, uh, with our pastors? I was like, okay, great. So you made to work with the pastors in San Diego, right? He says, no, I want you to come to the conference office. I said, the conference office? I'm, I'm just starting out here. Uh, I, um, I've been here for, you know, three or four years, and I still feel like there's more to do. Are, are you sure you want me to come to the conference office? I don't have a lot of experience. I'm still young, um, the elephant in the room, and all of these things. And I'm like, how, how are you calling me? And, and, and he said, Will, I keep sensing God putting your name on my heart. I'm like, okay. <laughs> well, that doesn't mean that God has put this on my heart as well, so I got to pray. And so I begin to pray, and, 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 and over a month, my wife and I really wrestled with this. Is this something that God is calling us to? We do not want to step into something that we should not be in. And we really wrestled with it. And, and, and then I, I remember accepting it. And then the reality of talking to pastors that, are, that have been in ministry to 20 to 30 years longer than me, what am I going to say to them? What am I going to do? How do I show up in spaces like this? What do I do? And, 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 and John said, Will, <laughs> it's simple. Just show up. Just show up. It is when we show up and allow God to use us with our weaknesses, with what we know is our, in, our, our, our inadequacies, what we know is our shortcomings. It is when we come into this space and we are truly vulnerable and we can truly understand who we are and, and, and understand who God is and that God loves us and accepts us just as we are. And from there leads us to where he's moving us toward. It is only here that we can experience fruit and growth by opening ourselves up and being truly vulnerable before God. I love this quote from Henry Nouwen. He says, I am deeply convinced that the Christian leader of the future is called to be completely irrelevant and to stand in this world with nothing to offer but his or own or her own vulnerable self. God is calling us to step into the arena of this world, 
God is calling us to step into the closets uh, that we have with him, those alone times with him, and to be vulnerable and to be real and to be open and to lean into his abundance instead of fearing the scarcity that we see around us. And it is, it is here that we get to the part that is truly transformative because to this point, any new age or anyone else in, 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 in our world today could pretty much say about the same thing. But it is when we move to this last point of contemplating Christ, of beholding Jesus, of seeing who he really is and taking him in, not just passing by, not just forgetting, not just knowing I've heard this story time and time again, but truly remembering what Christ has done. Paul says in Galatians 3, verses 1, O foolish Galatians, who has cast an evil spell on you? For the meaning of Jesus Christ's death was made as clear to you as if you had seen a picture of his death on the cross. In the message translation, it says these words, For it is obvious that you no longer have the crucified Jesus in clear focus in your lives. Whenever it is that I find myself off track, whenever it is that I find myself so hurried, so busy, so, so trying to prove or to feel like I am worthy of being a father or a husband or whatever role and title that I have, it is when I forget to have the clear focus of the crucified Jesus in my view. When I think of Jesus after he died and rose again and he came to the disciples, what did he have in his hands? What did Jesus have in his hands when he came to his disciples? When he appeared, he had scars. So many times we try to hide our scars. We try to cover up our scars, our shortcomings, but when Jesus comes, he comes with his scars. Because the gospel doesn't erase our scars, but scars tell us that healing has happened and that there's a story behind the scar that's there. And Jesus comes to his disciples saying, you know I was crucified, here's the proof, it's still there. I died for you, I rose for you, I'm here for you. The good news isn't that the cross went away. The good news is that the cross is here and that these wounds will continue to heal you. Amen. That what you're going through is not going to end your life. That what you're going through will not be the end of you. But the beginning of what God is doing in your life. And so I want to encourage you this morning to hold on to the fruit the only God can give. That we don't work to appear righteous and good and just, but that we rest in the goodness of God and allow that goodness to flow through our broken vessels, through our scars, through our wounds, through everything that has happened in our life, to be the wounded healers God is calling us to be in the world. I'm Pastor Tara Van Cross, and we're so glad that you've tuned into our Azure Hills Church YouTube channel. Please like and subscribe, and click on the bell so that you'll be notified every time we share new videos. We are so glad that you're here. Until next time, please know that we're praying for you as you continue to be a voice of hope.